let's talk about The Mask. One of my all-time favourite movies is The Mask. I'm a big classic slapstick comedy fan, superhero fan, comic fan, and of course, Jim Carrey fan. It's hard to imagine anybody ever pulling off what Jim Carrey did, and whether you love him, hate him, or are utterly confused by him nowadays, back in the day, that day being July 29th, 1994, he was the perfect guy for the job. Already getting himself plenty of recognition in the incredible In Living Colour before blowing up on screen as the equally incredible Ace Ventura alongside Courtney Cox. <laughs> Look how young she is. Jim Carrey's road to stardom continued not only with The Mask later that year, but went on with things like Dumb and Dumber, Batman Forever, Ace Ventura again, and The Cable Guy. Yeah, okay. Regardless, what I'm trying to say is that yes, he was popular, but it was these two films that fully put him on the map. He owned them. So much so that when people say The Mask, they instantly think of Jim Carrey's The Mask. But that isn't exactly how it started off, was it? Nope. Being that this was a sort of a superhero movie, I'm sure it will surprise nobody to hear that this was a comic book first. And just like all comic book movies, you will yet again not be surprised to hear that the source material is better, they didn't do it correctly, and the movie ruined it. But guys, in this instance, that's actually not true. You see, the incredible movie and the not-so-popular comics are two entirely different things. And today, I'm going to look into its creation, what it eventually become, what came after, and of course, the Super Nintendo video game, plus a few little extras thrown in for good measure. So, let's jump right in. Hi everybody, I'm DJ Slope from Slope's Game Room, and this is The Mask, The History, and The Games. Mike Richardson was the guy behind the creation of this awesome comic, and on top of this, he also is the guy behind Dark Horse Comics. He hadn't long graduated from Portland State University in 1977, and he was a big fan of comic books and pop culture retail bits and bobs. He quit his job designing products for a local furniture company to open the Pegasus Fantasy Bookshop instead. He did this by taking out a credit card with a $2,500 limit, maxed it out with stock and got to work selling, selling, selling. Thankfully, the gamble took off and several stores opened up throughout the following years after a name change to things from another world, including far more popular locations in places like Universal City Walk and Sony's Metreon in San Francisco. It was at these locations where he would often host meet and greets with comic book artists and he quickly realised that creators were often upset that the characters that they designed almost all of the time didn't belong to them, but instead the company that they worked for. If you want a good example of this, I highly suggest going to check out my Howard the Duck The History in the Games video. Anyway, as time went on with Mike's art degree no doubt helping give him a little bit more of a critical eye on the work he was selling on top of the complaining artist that continued to walk through his door, he decided to do something about it. The old cog started turning about the possible creation of a new comic book publishing house where creators get to keep all of the profits earned from the books and Dark Horse Comics were born. Mike was hoping to sell about 10,000 copies of his first release, Dark Horse Presents No. 1, but that target quickly got blew out of the water when the very first issue surpassed the 50,000 sales mark. Those Dark Horse Presents series are pretty much what you would expect, a series of short stories by different artists, some of which are one-off brand new tales, and others feature stories that span several issues. Quite a few big names that you're probably familiar with came from these pages, such as Concrete, Sin City, and Hellboy. But obviously, the one that we're going to be talking about today is The Mask, or should I say, The Mask. The original idea was drawn up by Mike himself when he wanted to create a bit of an anti-hero with an over-the-top bizarre nature about him and inspiration came from the Creeper and of course the Joker. 
and the ideas for the crazy green goon started before Dark Horse was even a thing. He sent his drawings of the mask to Mark Vereden, who put them in the APA 5 publication in 1985, a place for upcoming artists to show off their work. And yes, what you're looking at here was the very first design of the mask, but as stated, this was it. That was until issue 10 of the Dark Horse Presents comics when Mike contacted Mark Badger, a well-known artist who had worked on everything from Alien Legion to Doctor Strange, and told him his ideas for the character and the mask was born. If you think this looks crazy, just take a look at this. It's only his second rendition of the character, but he's changed quite a bit. The idea of the character is still here deep down, but Mark had really disregarded a lot of the original plans and created something new entirely, and doesn't really explain a lot of what is actually going on with this one. The mask literally turning up in the middle of a fight between two guys looking for someone called Montoya, it just gets weirder and weirder, and in his very next appearance, he ends up breaking the fourth wall and talking out against Mark himself in a sort of Deadpool-like two-page style mini-comic. However, as the story unfolds, more information is put forward about that original storyline. It's all very odd even by the Mars standards and the storyline got even more complex and out of control and Mark continued to miss deadlines for continuing the Mars comics so they decided to end the whole Mask arc as best they could in issue 21 by having Mark apologise for how random everything was and the Mask just literally blowing everybody up. Yeah, moving on. With the mask finally over, Mark decided to take it back to his roots and asked another artist, one Chris Warner, another guy well known for Alien Legion and Doctor Strange, and that's exactly what he did in a brand new mini story collection over in the Mayhem comics. This is the start of what comic book fans, not the movie fans, will know as the true birth to the mask. The Mayhem series only lasted four issues, but the stories found within continued for quite a few comics after that. And when I say comic book goers over movie goers, well I think we can all agree that these are incredibly different. The new plan was to make the mask a mix between Tex Avery cartoons and the Terminator. The result is a wacky, funny but also very disturbing and gruesome mashup that I absolutely adore. The idea is very similar, a young Stanley Ipkus here buys his girlfriend the mask as a birthday present before starting a ruckus outside and having absolutely no chance of defending himself. On his way home, he imagines different ways that he would brutally murder them in a very Tom and Jerry-esque mindset. His girlfriend accepts the presents, they go to bed, have sex, he wakes up to find it's been moved, presumably by his girlfriend to scare him, and when he puts it on to scare her back, he becomes the mask, a slightly more evil looking mask than what we've come to expect. The mask then goes out of the window, just like the movie, starts a fight and loses as he accidentally hits a lamppost before getting run over and finally realising that he has superpowers. And just like the movie, he thinks to himself that yes, he could be a superhero, but not before taking revenge on the gang that beat him up on the first couple of pages in true 1950s cartoon style of course. The only difference is, this is real life, and blood and guts fly all over the place. And this is the real tone of the comic, it's incredible, but for all those people that think it's just mindless, senseless violence, it isn't. It just isn't the be all and end all of the Mask comics, because as the story does continue, it gets a lot darker and crazier in its own right. The original Mask, all the way up until the release of the movie, was truly something special in comic book form. I'm not going to spoil everything that happens here, but what I will say is that if this does look right up your street, then I highly suggest going to pick up the Omnibus collections because everything after the movie The Mask in the world of comic books is still good, but not pre-movie good, <laughs> that's for sure. So, we've looked at the comics, now I think it's about time we look at the movie.
Taking what the original comic did and bringing it to the big time movie execs wasn't as easy as expected and during the late 80s the incredible Nightmare on Elm Street movies that had most definitely moved from being good psychological horror movies into more comedy horror as Robert Englund fully embraced the character and pretty much made him a household name but regardless no matter how many comics, video games, TV shows, board games and rap songs were released it was obvious that Freddy's days were almost numbered for the big screen and New Line Cinema wanted something new to fill the comedy gruesome horror porn hole and when you look at it like that, the mask, it fits in quite nicely. Also, not to get too nerdy, but just imagine if... Anyway, moving on, moving on. Dark Horse Comics had already started to make waves in Hollywood after their first film adaption was released called Mr. Giggles and Mike was pushing to get another two adaptions made too, one being Time Cop and one being The Mask. Charles Russell, who was a huge comic book fan and directed such films as 1987's Nightmare on Elm Street 3, one of the very best sequels in that series I'd like to add, and 1988's The Blob, one day at a comic book shop he saw the infectious looking character and he knew he had to make something of it. I noticed the comic in the comic book store and thought that really looks visually different. I didn't buy it, but I thought I'd go back and see because I thought it would make a good movie. Then I heard New Line just bought it and literally the same day they called me to see if I'd be interested to make a movie out of it. It was decided that the movie would be more action comedy rather than action horror comedy for various reasons. Firstly, the adaption for the time just worked better as a comedy on the big screen, but more importantly, it was because of Jim Carrey. Charles was a big fan of Jim and he knew he wanted to make a film with him in it. This was finally his chance. The Mask, as in the 1994 movie, was literally written for Jim Carrey, and therefore it is what it is. There were some obvious other reasons too, like the ability to make it a PG-13 for a wider audience, but you know, I didn't need to tell you that. Mike was all too happy for the changes to be made in this instance as he wanted to take his comics down a more comedy route anyway, rather than the splatterfest that it had been known for. Production got underway and concept art started to emerge of what the mask would possibly look like created by a small team at Industrial Light and Magic, the same team that worked on the Jurassic Park movies of all things. Obviously these look a lot more evil comedy based than what the film eventually become and one of the more interesting notes on these documents was that the mask was originally designed to be New Line's next and biggest franchise. Obviously that didn't happen but we will get to why in just a little bit. The movie was eventually released and as stated already for Jim Carrey fans, it was perfect. Yes, it was quite different than the source material, but thankfully in this instance they ended up going so far with it that it feels like its own thing entirely. The third rendition of The Mask really is something special. It's almost a family movie that used special and practical effects so well that to this day, 25 years later, it doesn't really look that dated. It's directed well, has an excellent soundtrack and score, and is super memorable. Jim Carrey released Ace Ventura, a film that nobody, especially Jim, expected to be as big as it was, and later that year, this was released. He took $450,000 for the role, being that he wasn't exactly that big time at the time, and to put that in comparison, his very next movie, Dumb and Dumber, was signed off at $7 million. Cameron Diaz, who was also a bit of an unheard actress at this point, in fact this was literally her first ever role, got about the same amount of money too. Everyone working on The Mask wanted a sequel to be made and when looking at our first piece of gaming media, mm, a kind of making of interactive CD-ROM, there is a whole section about The Mask too, with the following voice clips by Mitch Goldberg, the president of theatrical distribution, and Charles Russell, the director. We are working on a sequel. Jim Carrey is going to be in the sequel. You know, he likes the character Stanley Yip because he's told us he would love to do it again. And we're looking forward to the summer of 96 for Mask 2. And Milo will be back as well. I have no idea what we're going to do for Mask 2, but I hope it has some more dance numbers. The whole idea of a mask and what would happen if you put on a mask that would make your inner desires possible is a fascinating, resonant idea. I actually think most sequels the world could do without, but I know there's more that can be done on that theme 
And there's something so much fun about this particular actor, Jim Carrey, playing the mask. I, I personally would like to watch Mask 2, so maybe I'll become involved in creating it. We'll see. Well, I don't need to tell you guys that this never happened. Plans were put in place for the sequel to be made and released by the summer of 1996, but Jim refused, even though he was offered $10 million to reprise his role as Stanley Ipkiss. And why was this? Well, it's because of Ace Ventura again. He recently did When Nature Calls, the follow-up to the hit film, which reprised his role as Ace Ventura, and he quickly realized that he couldn't push the character any further. And because of that and that alone, he ended up turning down playing the mask for the sequel. Thankfully, some of those storyline elements that were going to be used for The Mask 2 actually ended up actually being used in the cartoon that was quickly released after the movie. And off the back of that, we got more comics, this time far more light-hearted comics and crazy amounts of random merch showing off the new styled green mask in his iconic yellow suit which was apparently modelled after a suit that Jim Carrey's mother made him for his first ever stand-up routine. Anyway, as this was the mid-90s after you have hit movies expected to become a big franchise, kids' TV shows, comics, lunchboxes, magazine, clothing, toys, board games, and masks, obviously, you obviously know what's going to happen next. That's right, video games. As you can see here in this awesome looking advert, the mask for the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo was being created by THQ in cooperation with New Line Cinema. Matt Harmon was the lead guy working on the project and as seen here in these early screenshots it's very obvious that this was going to be a sort of side scrolling beat em up platformer similar I suppose to something like Shinobi. Industrial Light and Magic were sending the team at THQ short designs on some of the abilities that the mask had in the movie, and the team were reportedly attempting to add them into the game. He can pull big mallets out of his pocket, popular scenes like the Coco Bungo nightclub were also going to be included, the crazy amount of weapons that were to be included in the game included things such as guns and kitchen sinks, and this looks like it would have been quite a unique brawler. There was also talk that Milo the dog would be included in the game, but details are a little bit hazy easy here, it wouldn't be a playable character, but instead you would actually interact with Milo on the fly throughout your mission, no doubt similar to the rat in Comic Zone. With digitized voice work taken straight from ILM's vault as you fought your way through Edge City to save Tina from the evil Dorian. We're trying to keep the look and feel of the movie. Of course, a video game can't really represent a movie unless you're trying to duplicate it, but we want the feel of it. The core of it is, it's got to be a good game. It's got to be a fun game to play. I'm looking forward to playing it myself. I think it's going to be a really great game. This all looked to be quite exciting. Sadly, however, it was never released. Well, not in this state anyway. Why? Well, one of the early development studios closed down and Matt ended up changing a lot of what was made here and created a game that was a lot more inspired by games such as Aladdin and Sonic the Hedgehog. Looking at the screenshots, not a lot was saved and even though several characters got changed into the released version, they were gimped in such a way that made them far more accessible to this new style of gameplay. The game itself is, uh, I don't know, about 7 out of 10 by 1995 standards and a little bit less than that nowadays. The game looks and sounds perfect, giving off a very clean Earthworm Jim vibe, but it's essentially a maze game. And I don't know about you, but for me, 90s maze games haven't aged well for the most part. And unless you are some crazy speedrunner that can finish the game in under 10 minutes, you will end up actually spending hours and hours and hours just trying to work out where you got to go. And considering every part of the seven stages looks super similar to where you've just been, you can get lost super quick. Thankfully, everything else about the game is spot on. Sure, the running is a bit manic, but for the most part, it feels and looks pretty good. There's no mistake in the fact that you are playing a mask video game here, and if that's all you're going for, then this really isn't a bad way to go. As stated, the Mega Drive version was being developed. In fact, it's believed the original version of the game was being developed for the Mega Drive first, but doing it the other way round would have apparently taken another four years to complete, and therefore, they decided to against it because who is honestly going to be talking about the mask later down the line, right? 
Another couple of games were made in LCD formats called Milo's Rescue and Masks Escape, and they are as good as you would expect. There is also this one too, but it's just a repackaged version of this one. To coincide with the release of the movie, you had an awesome behind the scenes CD-ROM, definitely something that's a bit past its time nowadays that not only shows off production shots and making of sections as well as them talking about the mask too, which I previously showed you, but they are also slightly interactive with quizzes and little sound effect studios too. There was also a CD-ROM released called The Mask Origin, which was a fully voice acted out origin story taken straight from the comics and, well, not a lot else. Late that night. Oh, I can't hear a motherfuck back It's tomorrow, Sunday or Monday. What? Jeez, it's just that mask I bought for Kath. She must have left it here to scare me. Well, let's see how she likes it. What the? Hmm. <laughs> and finally, you got one final game. Yet again, not released for the Game Boy Color. This looked to be a more generic platformer created by Pocket Studios and published by Dreamcatcher Interactive. Nobody knows why it wasn't released and all we have are these images taken from old issues of Edge magazine. And that's all there is. One semi-decent game and a whole heap of mess afterwards. The legacy of the mask after the film's release died down only a few years later when the cartoon and the adventures of comics eventually stopped and we got a few bizarre crossovers, one of which was incredibly stupid, however incredibly awesome. Sadly the sequel to Son of the Mask was eventually released and although I pride myself on being someone that can actually find good in products that tend to fall into the it's cool to hate on category, even I have to question why the hell didn't somebody stop them. The mask laid dormant for quite a while and sadly this was nowhere near the revamp that the studio was looking for. <laughs> Seriously, Hollywood should just stop making Jim Carrey sequels without Jim Carrey. Thankfully fans of the original movie and comics still do exist and we are a pretty hardcore bunch. A fan made movie recently came out and the original story got re-released not that long ago too with Mike Richardson constantly teasing in interviews that the mask is coming back. When that time comes you can be damn sure that I will be first in line. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. I want to give a big special shout out to this video sponsor, PlayerOneClothing.com. Be sure to go and check them out by clicking the link below and go and fill up your wardrobe with incredible video game and movie related garments. And before going ahead, I want to give a big special shout out to Akatimo84, aka Standstill Pictures. One of my patrons who actually had quite a few of the LCD games and a few of those obscure PC CD on mask titles and was able to capture some footage for this video there'll be a link over to his stuff in the description below and finally if you want to go check out any of the games playing on the screen it really does help the show if you use the play asia affiliate link below so that i can continue reviewing things for you guys anyway over to those patrons with a big special shout out going to that retro video gamer gary pinkett mantis ryan burford andrew dalton ben jackson jonathan hayward tomek grabowski christopher for Turnbull, Brent Craft, Phil Lowlands, Mr. Vestek, Dina, Robertson Dunn, Lefty, Intrigued Gaming, Abby Morris, Tim Labonte, Asobi Quang DX, Tim Lunn, Hananas, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Conrad Constantine, Pretendo64, Kareem the Elephant, James Loveridge, Casey Garner, Blitz, Hedgy, King Link Reviews, Retro Gaming Castle, Gemma at Mr. T's Shirts, Mike H. Fell, Lucas Softail, Ye Old Hamburglar, Gregory Arden, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Solix Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King Emo Cut, Tyndall, June, The Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float G, 
And of course, Petty Mew. If you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come and see what I'm working on and see all of the exclusive stuff that these patrons always get, including previews of what's coming up and random thought ramblings from me, then check the link that you see on the screen. You can come and sign up to my Discord as well, where I'm always hanging around. And I think that's probably enough plug-in for today. So for now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Alrighty then.